Welcome into the Thursday, August 4th edition of the Locked On Leafs podcast. I'm Mike DiStefano with Dave Morissuti. We're your hosts here of the show. And another longtime member of the Leafs family hanging up the skates and transitions to the player development department. We'll tell you who that is momentarily. Some interesting words from Max Pacioretty in a podcast recently in reference to his time in Vegas. We'll play those comments for you. They're pretty spicy. And Dave and I are going to build the perfect maple leaf. We're building the perfect Maple Leaf. What exactly does that mean, you ask? Well, keep listening to find out. This is the Locked On Leafs podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your Locked On Maple Leafs, your daily podcast on the Toronto Maple Leafs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Leafs podcast, one-stop shop for all things Leafs. I'm your host, Mike DiStefano from TSN 1050 Toronto Radio, also known as Al's brother on TSN's Overdrive and TSN 1050's Leafs Lunch. Joining me, it's my co-host, Dave Morissuti from Sportsnet, also a writer for the NHLPA. Locked On Leafs, a daily Maple Leaf-centric podcast, so be sure to subscribe for free. Wherever you get your podcast from, you can also now catch us up on video format on YouTube. Just search up Locked on Leafs on YouTube. Go ahead, hit subscribe, smash that like button. Also, leave a comment down below um, about what you want us to be talking about over the next few weeks before training camp gets started. We're in the dog days of summer, so uh, we're looking for some content ideas. Today is going to be an interesting one. We're, we're going to be building the perfect maple leaf. And this is a fun exercise that I've I've done in the past and I'm doing it again where we've got seven different categories that make up, you know, parts of a, a player's game. So, you know, the uh, we have hockey sense, we got shot, someone skating, physicality, a couple other intangibles and on-ice skills that go in part to making the perfect hockey player. We're going to try and build the perfect one using current Toronto Maple Leafs so that'll be fun we'll do that in just a moment but uh before we do Dave do we want to start with Rich Clune or with this Max Pacioretty stuff what do you think uh let's go with Leafs related first the Max okay. Pacioretty stuff is spicy but let's give uh Rich Clune his due absolutely so uh if you guys haven't heard already Rich Clune is retiring from professional hockey 16 years of pro hockey and uh 139 regular season NHL games but over 500 AHL games and if you're not necessarily a diehard hockey fan you might be saying to yourself uh who the heck is Rich Clune and why do I care um he's been with the Maple Leafs organization for seven years played a handful of games with Toronto I think 19 in total but did spend his last seven years of his career being a big part of the, the culture of the uh, Toronto Marlies. He was the, he was with the team when they won their Calder cup in 2018. He was been the captain there the last couple of seasons. He's been a terrific player and a terrific person for the Marlies in the community. Uh, He's a Toronto born kid. And uh, today he announced his retirement. It will be joining the Leafs development staff. So sticking around in the game of hockey, much like Jason Spezza, but uh, Rich Clune, you know, thanks so much for the service. 16 years of, of pro hockey is pretty sweet. And for somebody who did most of his damage in the uh, in the American League, you know, really grinding it out, but doing some good stuff for his community, for Toronto, um, and, and helped a lot of players. I, I quickly want to read a, a bit of a testimonial, per se. My good buddy, Frankie Carrado, when he played with the uh, Leafs or when he played with the Marlies, he had a good chance uh, to play with Rich Clune. And speaks very highly of him. I asked him, I said, Hey, do you mind giving me a quick, you know, comment about your former teammate? And I could share with the listeners on the podcast, get to know Rich Clune a little bit. Listen to what this guy had to say, Dave. He said, the amazing thing about Rich is that if you ask any player on the team, who their best friend is, they would say Rich Clune. That is so rare. I think that speaks volumes to the character of Rich and how we he is just able to relate to everyone on the team as well as finding ways to make them comfortable and bring out the best in them as people and players. He's a great person and a great friend, and he's going to continue to do great things with the Maple Leafs organization. Like Those are the type of people who you really root for in the game, who you really hope have long, successful careers, not only on the ice, but then when they're ready to transition off the ice. And it looks like the Maple Leafs, like they've been doing over the last few seasons, 
um, will be welcoming him into the off-ice program and allowing him to uh, join Haley Wickenheiser's lease development staff. Yeah, and, and for those who also don't know, like with Rich Clune, my uh, my big thing with him was always the the movie they did about him. Yes. Like, um, incredible story. Like, a guy who at one point, I think he was celebrating 10 years sober when the movie had come out. If you don't know, the movie's called Hi, My Name is Dickie. Just an, a really incredible story about somebody who went through a very rough moment in his life got clean, came sober and didn't just celebrate the fact he was sober, but was giving back and helping a lot of athletes that were in his position, dealing with similar struggles that he had and helping them. Cause clearly this is someone who didn't have it when he was younger and he finally found the path he needed to get on. And now he's in the right spot, but that's, that's part of the reason why I think the, the Leafs kept them around for so long too, is He's just the character he brought. You mean you brought up uh, Frankie's testimonial there like that right there speaks to, you know, he might not be a star player in terms of production, but what he brought to a to a Marley's team that relies on a lot of young players. There's not really a better professional that you could have than Rich Clune. And I think the fact that he's sticking around with the Leafs organization, too, I think speaks a lot to what the Leafs organization also thinks about him. Absolutely. And like you, you just take a look at the last few seasons of his career and keep in mind, if I'm not mistaken, I do recall also Rich Clune stepping behind the bench and being a bit of a player coach at times too, because he didn't play full seasons the last like four years. He played 15 games in 1819, just 16 games in 1920. Um, and then in the lockout year played third or in the COVID year, sorry, played 33 games, his first season as the captain of the team. And then this past year, 59 games, but just 12 goals or 12 points rather than I told goals, 12 points, but all in all, he has 21 points in his last four seasons of pro hockey. So, yeah, skill, you know, being, a, you know, a producer is not necessarily, you know, what makes Rich Clune, um, you know, captain material. And it's not what kept him in the league, I guess, for, for so long. It's the leadership that he provided. So if he can just be part of the least development staff and just, you know, keep being that good veteran presence for these young kids coming up through the system i think that is a great addition to uh to the leafs uh, development staff and um i like what they're building you know i really like what they're building starting with uh, obviously haley wickenheiser's kind of the the head as the assistant general manager now but also will be you know heading up the development staff and bringing on rich clune i think is a, a solid solid move he's a solid solid dude and good luck hope uh, all the best Speaking of people who have moved on, Jason Spezza. Did you see this video of Jason Spezza at the Holinka tournament, by the way? Before we get to this patch of ready stuff and we build the best leaf, why don't we play this video? Can you pull this up, please? Um, I sent it to you just a moment ago. This is Jason Spezza. So the Holinka Gretzky tournament, which is the U18 tournament of, you know, just I guess your, your first chance really for a lot of these scouts to get their eyes on these upcoming draft players for next season um, in the uh, it used to be the Ivan Holinka now it's the Holinka Gretzky tournament and so you've got GM scouts AGMs and whatnot so all these different entities that are taking in these games and there's Jason Spezza gets the gets the call to go down to the Holinka tournament I can't recall where it's being played this year I don't know if it's in Canada or if it's elsewhere it looked like it may have been in in Europe somewhere it typically is in Europe um, Never seen old dogs and puppies. Steve Eisenman watching. Jason Spezza just added to the Leaf ma management staff, writing furiously. Ron Hextall <laughs> watching, taking it all in. Spezza writing, writing, writing. Kevin Sheveldayoff watching. Spezza <laughs> writing an essay. Uh, <laughs> 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 There's a there's a lot. Remember, he doesn't know any of these players, right? That's funny. That is funny. You've got everyone just watching. Right. You've got all the GMs, you know, Shevel Dayoffs, Eisman. They're just watching the tournament. Spets is sitting there rifling through pages, writing down essays on every single one of these guys. He's going head first into this whole 
you know, assistant to the general manager situation, seeing exactly where he wants to go, scouting, development, whatever it may be. Um, looks like you got the scouting situation handled uh, this past week at the Holinka tournament. Canada, by the way, advancing to the uh, semifinals. I think they'll play Finland tomorrow, uh, so that'll be cool. But um, I, I thought that was just hilarious to, to see Spezza, you know, just kind of doing his thing, <laughs> just going – Ham being the the hockey nerd that we all know he is. Oh yeah, I mean, and, and so many people was like Jason Spezza, just like looking stressed, like he had ho- like like homework. Yeah. Essentially, scouting is homework, but like, I I think I mean it's it's a nice thing because he's a he's a guy who likes to try different things. And hey, some people say he's gonna be a future GM in the league. He's learning. Uh, he, they're throwing him right into it, I guess. Yeah, yeah, and I'm sure he is loving. Every second of it. All right, we'll uh, we'll play the Max Pacioretty stuff on the other side, and we'll build the best Maple Leaf possible also. That's what's coming up on the show. But before we get any further, let me tell you about one of today's show sponsors, and that's BetOnline.net. It's the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your betting needs. Find all your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. Find reviews and news of every league, including Major League Baseball, the NFL, NBA, NHL, Combat sports, esports, and even golf. Bet Online continues to be the top resource for all your sports wagering information from live in game betting, scores, podcasts. They got you covered. Head to the Bet Online today or use your mobile device to learn more about the action happening today. Bet Online, it's where the game starts. Welcome back into the Locked On Leafs podcast. I'm Mike Stefano with Dave Morissuti. We're our hosts here of the Locked On Leafs podcast um we're going to get to our you know build the best leaf uh in a moment but before we get to that i do want to play these comments made by max patcheretti a couple of days ago on the was it the raw knuckles podcast i believe it was yeah. uh with former maple leaf tim stapleton um all, or yeah tim stapleton uh part of uh one of the the co-hosts of the podcast um did you see these comments I saw them like they kind of just kind of came out of nowhere. I'm like, first off, I didn't know that I knew I knew about the raw knuckles podcast with Stapleton. I think it's Chris Nyland or mm. yeah, Nyland. I can't remember how to pronounce his last name, but like, yeah, it's a pretty raw. <laughs> they literally call it the raw knuckles podcast because they it's it's a very raw type of podcast. Yeah, it's no filter. It's no filter. But I like when when former players do that, they just allow these guys to kind of open up and speak freely i mean obviously spitting chicklets does a pretty good job of doing that missing curfew boys do a pretty good job and and raw knuckles is another podcast out there that does a good job of of you know they kept a lot of their contacts and their former teammates and friends that they made within the game of hockey and they bring them on they just chit chat and and they're able to get a lot of really good answers and one in particular they got from max patcheretti the other day about kind of the lack of accountability um, when he he felt when playing in Vegas in comparison to the Montreal Canadiens. I thought it was really interesting. So why don't we go ahead and play those comments now, and then we'll, uh, we'll get our thoughts on the other side. And I, and I, there are good sides to everything. So when I first got there, I was almost like, it was kind of weird that there was no accountability. And I'm not talking about like within the team, I'm talking about like, like everywhere, you just couldn't like you couldn't feel pressure coming off of anyone else from the coach from the management. Like, I mean, I would play. I had an awful game, and I come in, and everyone's saying hi to me, and I'm like, "Okay, this is a little <laughs> weird." Like normally, like we walk by each other and like stare at the carpet, and then at the same time, like I, if, even if you wanted to find out what the media was saying about you, I don't even know how you would even go about that because it's like. I don't even know where the media would be on Twitter. I don't even know what to search or anything like that. So (laughs) there was a relief when I got there, but then I found myself being like, okay, I got to kind of like reel this thing in and, and and hold myself to a higher standard and hold myself. Yeah, exactly. Which I had always done my whole life, but maybe I got away from that a little bit when I had everybody else kind of holding me accountable. So in fact, I even mentioned that at the end of the year, I'm like, and, and I didn't say it specifically, but I'm like, I, I'm not saying I, I wanted to, this to be like playing back in Montreal, but I even told her, I'm like, you gotta, 
you know, no one's really holding us accountable. If we have a bad year like this, like the city would like be half on fire in Montreal. And here we are, we're <laughs> showing up to the rink and it's 80 degrees and it's sunny and we're getting our car wash and getting our organic food and our go play you know, golf. Yeah, yeah. Go play, play golf. Black and Jack. I was kind of like, <laughs> no, we got to kind of police this thing a little bit better amongst each other because like, it, I don't want to say it's a country club, but uh, like you have no one from the outside holding you accountable. So I never thought in a million years that I'd be feeling this way. But but at the end of the day, I, I kind of look at, OK, what can I have done better this year? And, and that was almost like I'm not saying I'm going to you know be like uh, a journalist that's going to go rip a player. But at the same time, a lot of these guys haven't played somewhere else, so they don't know really what it's like. And and I felt myself personally, uh, it always gets the best out of you when you have either a coach or somebody or my parents, uh, not with hockey, but with other stuff, like when they're demanding and hold you accountable and. And I found myself almost missing that a tiny bit when things went wrong this year. And I know it sounds crazy and yeah, no, <laughs> people I, might I jump know what on you're me. Saying. Yeah. So I, I, I know it. Yeah. And it's just a part of the evolution sure. of, uh, as Chris mentioned before, like being a different person and growing up. And, and uh, yeah, I find myself, you know, kind of wanting that accountability now. But when I first got traded, definitely not. I, I, I had to kind of, take a step back and, and reel myself in when it came to some interesting comments made by uh, Max Pacioretty throwing a little bit of shade out to, uh, out to, to, to Vegas. And I mean, they did upheave their coaching staff. They brought in uh, Bruce Cassidy and, and brought in some new fresh blood. So perhaps that was something that even management and, and, you know, ownership noticed as well, or, you know, they heard what Max Pacioretty had said and said, you know what, that's true. Maybe we do need a new voice. And from what I've heard coming out of Boston was that was kind of the situation in Boston was Bruce Cassidy was a little bit too hard on his players. So now going the complete opposite end of things and getting someone who really holds you accountable for everything. I wonder how that's going to work out. Um, but either way, it's, 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 first of all, it's like very honest uh, for Pacioretty to come out and talk like that. But um, it's kind of a interesting little nugget that he gave there. Yeah, I, I thought the you know he went from from what it sounds like he went from two drastically different situations. Montreal, absolute pressure cooker, and he was the captain for three seasons. So even he yeah. he wasn't spared from any of the criticism. To he then, said he's uh, like I don't even know where to go on Twitter, like to even see what the media is saying. Like I have no idea. It's not yeah. on ESPN. Like it's on. Well, I guess now it is, but like last couple of years that it hasn't really been on ESPN, right? Like no, it's like, the leading thing on sports center. What's going on with the Canadian hockey teams that is not leading ESPN sports center in America when he flips on the tube. No. And it's like in Vegas before the Raiders got there. Yeah. They were, they were the big kind of sports stick in town. Now it's the Raiders. So that definitely, uh, takes the takes a bit of out of a lot out of the like i guess the spotlight off that team in a way but yeah. no it, it, it kind of feels like you know there's a reason why certain players go to certain markets to go play i think patch ready kind of a, hearing him talk about it and then you hear how some players who don't want to play in a canadian market because there's the constant screw scrutiny and what is it's like oh why did Johnny Gaudreau want to go and play Columbus rather than go and play in Calgary? Well, uh, I think I think you're. I think when you hear about Vegas, a non-traditional hockey market, and how the media perception just there's no one criticizing the team outside of the organization. I'm sure that the coaching staff may have criticized the team. I don't think they were just saying, "Yeah, guys, we lost last night, but it's all cool, man. It's all cool. Like we'll we'll get the we'll get it next time." No, no, I'm pretty sure the coaching staff wasn't happy about losing. But I think what Pat Reddy was really alluding to was when they were losing and when they were not like in danger of missing the playoffs, there wasn't this like panic outside yeah. of like in Vegas. You didn't see that. I and I follow some of the people who kind of you know are <laughs> are in the loop about Vegas. It's and like I, they I, just I, assume like everyone's gonna get healthy and we'll we'll limp into the playoffs mm-hmm. and we'll be fine because we're the Vegas Golden Knights and that's that's all we know is is playoff hockey and it didn't happen ultimately it, you know 
uh, the guys were not healthy for a, a large part of the season. And then, you know, even when Eichel finally did come, I think they're like a 500 team. Once Eichel came on to the scene, like they had the same record as Buffalo pretty much the, since Eichel returned to the ice, it was kind of wild. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I also to take this into a Leafs direction, you know, kind of makes you think too, like there's some, there's, do you believe there's a lack of accountability in the Maple Leafs? Like, based on what you heard from people this year, that no, you don't think so. I don't. I don't, I don't think so because I think there are some guys in that room that will speak up. Who? Who do you think will speak up? I think Morgan Riley is a guy that would speak up when things aren't going right. Yep. Wayne Simmons. I don't think Wayne Simmons is holding back. Well, I mean, more so like your stars, right? Like. Wayne Simmons, love the guy. So we've but... seen John Tavares. I know he's not the most fire. We've seen it before, though. Like when they won, I remember the one time I really saw John Tavares kind of just like talk and like really get riled up. The first game Sheldon Keefe coached. And then after the game, we saw them in the locker room and John Tavares just went on this like rant. He's like, good, good on this, but now we got to, we got to start something, right? He really like started. You could see he was pretty like. Well, because he took the Babcock firing to heart, right? Like that, yeah. Bab, he was Bab's guy, right? Like Babcock made him captain, and you know they had a good relationship. I think so he took that to heart, and so that when he got fired, he was like, "We gotta make sure, you know, we hunker down and get this thing done because we let down one guy. We can't let this guy down." So that you know, I guess you could say there was accountability in that aspect, where it was like you already got one coach fired. You really want to get a second one fired? No, we'll then get your act together and start playing some good hockey. Since they were like roughly 500 at the time when the when when Babcock got fired, but I just wonder. I look at at it more from up top, and and the fact that they haven't done much. Um, it was a lot of fringe work this off season after a sixth consecutive first round exit. It's just you know if if maybe there's not enough accountability you know, from the tippy top, from MLSC's end of things and putting that pressure and that accountability onto Shani and then onto Dubis and then onto Keith, then onto the players. Like there should be a trickle down of accountability and the fans are up in there as well. I mean, the fans will hold you accountable, I suppose. But, you know, in terms of your actual on ice products, I don't necessarily know if there's enough accountability from the tippy top trickling all the way downward. It seems like there's some sort of comfort with, the group that they have, and there's a belief that the group that they have that hasn't worked will eventually work, and they're not really inclined to change their minds about anything, and there's no pressure to do so. It, it, I just, I don't know, it kind of made me start thinking about that a little bit after I heard these Pacioretty comments. I, I think in a way you are right in that there sort of seems to be, the urgency doesn't really seem to be there in terms of, this was a, you know, losing again in the playoffs, there should be a lot of anger about it, right? There should be a lot of frustration. Like I see it when when the Amazon when they did the Amazon series and you see Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner in that locker room, kind of looking devastated. You can see that there there's an element of that they care. Um, but yeah, like who's who's stepping up to kind of say this isn't right? We heard that John Tavares had that uh uh, had that meeting at his cottage up north. Yes, that's that's yeah. what I think, right? And you know, getting the guys together and realize, look, this is not right. We should not be losing. We should not be having things like this happen. But I think it shouldn't be happening after the fact. It should be happening when you're you're the, the disturbing things are happening, right? You blow a lead or you don't show up against the Buffalo Sabers. That's where you have to kind of get get your um everything uh, that's where you really need to speak out in those moments not after the fact not after the deed has been done and now you, you, the two guys who have been vocal i guess you could say in the locker room or during games during play jason spezza who has been vocal and he was the one who apparently ripped into the club um was it after the chicago game early in the year that kind of get them going this season and wayne simmons who ripped into them in the playoffs as well, um, reportedly. So those two players, I mean, you know, 
Spets is gone. He's not going to be there to be able to pick you up. Simmons, I'm not convinced that he's going to be on this roster on on uh, on opening night. Like I'm, I'm just simply not. So then, somebody else from within is definitely going to have to pick up the slack in terms of you know holding themselves accountable and you know mid game when they realize that they don't have it, figure out a way to dig deep and get the best out of those players. Someone's got to play that role. Whether if it's Tavares, you know Morgan Riley, maybe this year finally, you know a Mitch Marner or or um, I don't know potentially, you know I guess Matthews could do it. Somebody's going to have to step up into those leadership roles. So we'll see what happens, though. We'll see what happens. Um, I'm trying to think. We we may have to push the building the leaf to tomorrow, Dave. We're already up to no, 26. No. We might have to push it to tomorrow. I think I think given how much content it take is gonna is need well, we need to spread out a little bit. I'm, I'm okay with that. Tell you what, we're gonna do a two parter. We're gonna do the. Do we want to give a tease? Maybe we can build do a, little the, a little tease. What do you want to tease? Well, do we want to tease like just maybe one how how this will work and how. Maybe sure. We Why don't we do that? Yeah. Why don't we do that? So we can each choose one. You choose whichever, uh, whichever category you want. So I'll tell you the categories. That's what we'll do. We'll tell you the categories and we'll show you how it's going to go. And then we'll get into it tomorrow. Um, the categories for, or the way that we're going to do this is we're going to take the best, um, or we have seven different categories and we're using, we can only use one current Toronto Maple Leaf to use from that category. And we're trying to build the best hockey player possible, the best Maple Leaf possible. So for example, one that we have is why don't we do um, let's quickly do skating. Cause that one was one where I couldn't really decide. There was a couple of guys who I thought about, but then I was like, ah, I used them here. Maybe I want to use this player here. So that was an interesting one, but hockey sense shot passing hands uh skating physicality engine and leadership are the seven categories that we are doing but why don't we do a little tease and talk about who we believe uh or who is the skater that we would like to implement as our player which skating or player would we like to replicate for our guy who do you have i got william nylander okay okay He's got a nice smooth stride. He seems to be able to get out of uh, out of you know a guy that can break the puck out of the zone. Has I, I I know there was questions about his hustle in the playoffs. Well, that's why I didn't have William Nylander ultimately, and 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 he he was the first name that popped onto my onto my list because I didn't have him in in a couple of the other ones. So he was the first name that popped onto my list. And that I kept going back to that playoff game against Tampa where he held up and didn't go after the puck off that dump in. And I just couldn't put him as my skater. Somebody who's so inconsistent with hustle like that, I don't think that I would want that but as, uh, as the main trait for my player. That's a mental thing, though, with Nylander. You take his skating ability and you put it with somebody else's hockey sense oh you're right you're right that could be that could uh yeah that could work that could it's work safe to say, William Nylander was not going to be my hockey sense guy <laughs> no or safe that. to say safe to say um or engine I suppose he wasn't going to be your your engine your physicality that's for sure um so ultimately I decided not to go with Willie I went a little off the board I think Pierre Engvall I chose Pierre Engvall skating like He's a smooth skater. He's a big guy who can skate really well for his size. So for him, oh, that's what I forgot. We should put size in there. I forgot. <laughs> we should put size as one of our, uh, <laughs> as one of them. Okay. So we're adding size. We now have eight categories. But Pierre Engvall is a type of player that uh, th- that I really, you know, admire his skating ability. It's very smooth. And, you know, you talk about a guy who can break the puck out. He is one of the best players on the team when it comes to um, like breakouts per 60 zone exits. So he's somebody who could really skate and uh, he back checks four checks and he kind of gives it 110% most of the time as well. So uh, I really like him as a skater. So that's why I had P 
Pierre Engvall as my best skater. The other player who I considered was TJ Brody on the back end, who I think is a really good skater as a defenseman. So uh, those were the three players who I was considering. And ultimately, I landed on Engvall. You landed on Willie. Who else have we landed on for the remaining now seven uh, categories that we got here to build the best leaf? Well, you'll have to tune in tomorrow because we're going to continue this podcast and continue this tomorrow. So make sure that you do tune back in. Make sure you're subscribed wherever you get the podcast from audio form and also you're subscribed on video and hit that little notification bell so that you know when each and every video does get uh, published onto YouTube as well. You'll never want to miss uh, a podcast that we put out. We do at least three pods a week for the next six weeks or so. And then once camp gets going, we're back to five a week, baby, Monday to Friday, full stop content all the way through the Maple Leaf Stanley Cup parade. Yep. Calling it right now. Called it right there. Just kidding. Hopefully, I mean, let's fingers crossed, knock on wood here. Maybe that will happen. But uh, yeah, so make sure that you're uh, locked into what's going on with the Leafs with us here at Locked on Leafs. All right, that's going to do it for us today, though. I'd like to thank you all for listening and supporting the show. You can follow myself on Twitter at Mickey underscore Canuck. Follow Dave at D underscore Morissuti. Follow the show at Locked on Leafs. Go ahead, leave a like and a comment down below. Um, we'll be back tomorrow with uh, continuing our Build the Best Leaf segment here on the podcast. But until then, keep it locked right here on Locked on Leafs.